OK, let's get started. So good morning, everyone. Welcome to this month's webinar at Mayor Rehab on sex intimacy with disabilities. I know there is a different title on there, so let's be precise. Somatic sex coaching and partner surrogate therapy. Very interesting subject. Before I introduce you to our guest speaker, I'd uh, just like to add a few things. The webinar is uh, scheduled from, from now until 11. Um, any questions can be asked after the webinar. Um, we would be grateful if you can let us know your thoughts after so we can see how successful it is and if it's something we would like to run again. So please let us know. Um, there is an option for typing your questions at the end or your comments at the end. Um, and then we can, if you don't want to speak up, we can ask the speaker on your behalf. So just as a background, really, um, this subject is often ignored. Um, there are several charities who are helpful with these issues, such as Enhance the UK and many, which is a user led charity, but others too. We're fortunate to have Miss Beaver Meadows to speak with us today. So she's going to be our guest speaker. Most of us, um, like any of us working with clients with disabilities, I think we're all too aware this subject can be ignored, but it's a vital part of life for, for many of our clients and our family members. I think we all understand that physical disabilities, who are the client group that we often will work with or know of, um, often result in altered sexual function, and it can negatively affect self-image and self-esteem. Certain things may come into question such as mobility, if they're a wheelchair user or have a cast or a prosthesis. That's why we want to raise this subject with our friends in this industry where we work. It shouldn't be left to our colleagues to ask those questions that some of us some find, of find awkward um, and how their disability has affected their ability to be intimate. We should all have some awareness and understand that it's probably a big deal. So. I'm now going to hand over to someone who is an expert in her field who can enlighten us all much more with her role and her aims. So I'll hand over to Miss Beaver Meadows. Thank you, Beaver. Lovely. Thank you very much. Good morning, everybody. So I'm going to start with, um, well, I have a, a, a presentation, a slideshow, and also three of my clients. Um, have uh, consented to either have me speak about uh, the work that we did together or they're going to speak for themselves so that's going to happen a little later on in the presentation uh, but thank you Jill and thank you Gabby for inviting me I'm not gonna lie I'm terrified this is my first webinar like can you believe it in the whole of lockdown when everyone went online I just kind of went on my boat and just disappeared for a bit so here I am doing this webinar with this crazy technology and um, we had a little bit of a stress because we weren't sure that the presentation downloaded. We didn't get a chance to test it. So there is a little video um, halfway through the presentation and hopefully that will work. Um, if it doesn't, we'll just have to figure it out as we go along. Um, and uh, on another thing that I just want to mention is that I want to disclose that I have really bad brain fog so um if i lose my words or kind of um and ah and i and i can't and i and i lose my train of thought it's uh maybe a menopause thing and i know uh um well i kind of made a commitment to myself to not hide uh, the brain fog and to to be very open about it as an example to others um especially those with hidden disabilities where they feel that um the condition impacts them in some way. And just by saying that out loud, actually I'm noticing in my body that my nervous system is starting to relax and I've given myself permission to not do this perfectly. <laughs> okay, so I'm gonna start with a little bit of bio about myself and I'm gonna read it out because I'm really good at my job, but I'm really bad at promoting myself. So I've just done a little write up, which I'm gonna read. So I'm looking away from the screen. So, I started my career as the disability sex coach after 45 years of lived experience as a religious cult incest survivor, uh, which sounds quite, ah, um, but it's 
one of the main reasons that I ended up working in the field of sexuality and sexology. Uh, initially, I trained in dance movement therapy. Uh, I can hear a hissing. Oh, it's, it's. Can you all hear a hissing on your end? Yeah, I'm wondering if. Slightly, it's not too loud. Though. Is it okay? I'm not sure where that's coming from. Oh, it's stopped now. It's okay. It's it's not it's not affecting what we're hearing, Beaver. It's fine, I think. Great. Okay, I'll carry on. Uh, initially, I trained in dance movement therapy. Dance is my first love, and I worked with severely disabled clients. Uh, later, I became a student of psychosexual somatics and sexology, conscious sexuality and Dr. Betty Martin's Wheel of Consent, which um, I use in all of my sessions and is the backbone and framework for all of my work with my clients. Um, and my studies in psychosexual somatics was primarily to heal my own sexual trauma. Uh, I was preoccupied with my guilty secret of being a sex worker and was very confused about my sexuality and how to express that in a healthy way. I viewed the world through a sexual lens and I carried immense shame and guilt, uh, not least the old trope that all sex workers are victims of sexual trauma and therefore broken. I soon realized that I could do this work partly because of my early trauma and my early erotic blueprint, but that's only one piece of the puzzle. Um, the most common question I get asked about my work is how and why do you do this work or how is it you got into this work and why do you do this work? So this is a, you know, a background and an explanation of why I've gone into this field or rather created this role. It's a very unique role and I believe that I think I'm one of the few in the country that do this. Um, and understanding conscious sexuality uh, and the sacredness around sexuality and reclaiming the role of the sacred whore, if you like, has been pivotal in my healing um, and it, in clarifying what it is I offer and why, because motivation and intention is everything, especially when it comes to sexuality, which can get very um, murky and um, lose clarity. Uh, so by reframing sexual trauma, um, and employing my demons to work in my favour instead of against me brought me finally to a place of peace and prosperity in my life. So your greatest wound can be your greatest gift. Choosing to work in the emerging scientific field of sexology as a somatic coach and surrogate within the conscious sexuality movement is my offering to the world. I'm passionate about shifting patriarchal structures that objectify, commodify, and deprive people's sexuality, especially the damage caused by unrealistic beauty standards and rape culture. Since listing on the TLC Trust website in 2019, I have a clinically endorsed thriving private practice with a 12 month waiting list. Alongside this, I have a growing social media presence as an ally and advocate championing the sexual rights and sexual accessibility in the disabled community. My long-term vision is to create a purpose-designed, fully accessible, inclusive intimacy space for sex coaching and rehabilitation sessions, sex education and partner surrogate therapy, a space that ultimately can accept NHS referrals. <sighs> That's me. And that's why I do what I do. And now onto the main presentation. I'm gonna, the next slide that I'm gonna show you is an illustration. It was drawn by a colleague of mine and we worked um, with a client. He's on the call now and he will probably pop up later on in the Q&A, no doubt. And he has given full consent to share this slide and to share the story. And we're gonna see a little bit more of him in the presentation in the video. Um, and I want you, before I put the slide up, I want you to take a moment to, um, to uh, digest the slide, read the captions, look at the picture. I'm going to give you a minute or two and then we're going to discuss it. You should see it up now. Can you all see it? Great.
Okay. So um, yeah, this was this was drawn by a colleague of mine. She describes herself as a graphic medicine artist and a manuensis and a workshop facilitator. So she works with clients capturing um, their stories um, through illustration um, as a therapeutic mod modality. And this was a, an illustration that she drew for a client of mine um, as he was uh, exploring his sexuality within sex therapy. So he started off in sex therapy and then I, as the surrogate, I was called in to do the physical aspect of our um, sexual journey together. And I'm just wondering, um, for those of you that are listening in, the clinicians, the, the RAs, the care, the care managers, the case managers, and the clients, I'm wondering how many of you have kind of, uh, you know, can resonate with this scenario or have thought, even thought about this scenario, or have been in a, in a difficult position where you kind of uh, have, have encountered some aspect of some someone's sexuality and then kind of gone, oh, this is really uncomfortable. I don't really know what to do. This is, you know, not really my job description. Or perhaps you work with a client and you can see that they have sexual needs that are unmet um, and there's some sexual frustration and maybe even some acting out um, that's inappropriate and you don't really know what to do with that. Um, and I think, you know, th this client in particular, he, um, th the idea that that this need of his is not just uh, for pleasure, you know, is actually um, for medical reasons. We all know the benefits of a healthy sexual expression and regular sexual expression. So this is sexual expression as a rehabilitation goal, not just for adult entertainment. And when I think about the position that this puts carers in, and carers then saying it's not in my job description, like, you know, is this legal? But, you know, what do I do with this? I'm not really trained for this. I'm not paid enough to deal with something that is as complex as someone's sexual needs. And also that it's, you know, it's not just a, a sexual issue. It's a health and well-being issue. And I think there's a huge movement uh, in at the moment in our culture where we're moving away from sexual entertainment, the adult en entertainment industry, there's a branch um, coming into the realm of health and well-being. So this is, you know, as much a health and well-being as it is a personal issue um, and also a social issue, because to deprive somebody of sexual expression is discrimination. Um, and finally, last piece on this slide, um, that sexuality, you know, is working with someone's sexuality is highly specialised. There is a psychosexual element, an emotional element, a physical element, a cognitive element to it. So it's rather complex. So what are the options for disabled people, for your clients, for um, especially clients that are in um, residential housing? Well, at the moment, um, there are two there are two main options. One is the TLC Trust. So the TLC Trust is an online uh, directory um, and they there are a list of sex workers that provide sexual services um, for disabled people. Now, it's a great website. It's part of the um, outsiders um, the providers are vetted. Uh, in so much that they um, they are known for their um, for their for being able to work with disability. But as far as training goes, in either sexology or specialising in people with disability, that's a little bit of a grey area. There is no training currently for um, sexology and disability as it stands in the UK at the moment or anywhere else in the world, as far as I'm aware. Oh, actually, that's not true. Um, Australia have just released an online training course for sex workers um, for professional disability awareness training. Um, that's, I believe, the first of its kind. Um, so if a client is looking to express or explore their sexuality, you can contact the TLC Trust and you can select a provider 
from there, but in terms of how they work with the client and what their skill sets are and how sympathetic or, um, you know, experienced they are is a bit hit and miss. Um, or you can go down the route of sex coaching and partner surrogacy, which is what I do. So I have training uh, in psychosexual somatics and coaching and the wheel of consent. So my sessions uh, isn't is not just about servicing clients and, and giving them um, sexual release. It's around a whole exploration of how they can explore and express their sexuality, what is needed, what that looks like to them, what it means to them, what the outcomes are for them. So it's a whole complete uh, dialogue and journey that we go on together. Um, and I guess, you know, the best way for me to, to show this is to show you this little video. So let's meet Thomas, um, the poster boy for partner surrogacy, as it were, as the service delivery rehabilitation model. Oh. And I'm wondering whether this is it. There's a new soap. Can you smell it? Can you see the video? Can you, can you hear the, the video? And the light. And we've got the advert. The Dr. Squatch Star Wars collection um, is here. Hang on a second. natural nourishing ingredients in four galactic scents. There's a pad and a bath for everyone. Oh, you smell like you slept inside a tauntaun. Take this. <laughs> Are you a Jedi kind of guy? Lather up with only hope soap. Feeling wise? Wisdom wash is the way. Okay, now Wanna my... Want to dabble um... with the dark side? Dark side scrub. You've frozen, Beaver. Can you hear us? She's frozen. Everything has frozen. <laughs> I think she might have frozen herself out with the video. <laughs> yeah. Probably well, we try and draw down too much. Hmm. Mm. Let's give it a minute. Hopefully, she'll get back in. Oh, so if you click on the I think just as realised, I think if you clicked on the picture, it played the video, but I think it's just been taken down because Viva left. And there's a video. Does play. She should be able to come back in. Sorry, everyone. Just hang on a mo. Yeah. Bother. Interesting so far. She's back. Hello. She's back. <laughs> Hello. 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 I'm back. Well done. <laughs> so um, that totally crashed uh, teams trying to play that video. I apologize for that. That's all right. Don't worry. It doesn't matter. I think uh, we'd rather have you than the video. Okay. Um, so now I can't get back to look for the video in the chat if anybody's interested. Great. So now I can't get back to my slideshow. It's disappeared. Can you still see? Can you still see it? You can't see it either. Let me see if I can upload it again, and um, and then you might have to take control again, Beaver. Bear with me a second. Thanks, Gabby. I'll just pull it up on my phone, and then at least I can do it from my. I, at least I can see at my end, she says ambitiously. <laughs> I 
Well, anyway, maybe I can describe the video for you while we're waiting. So it's um, it was a short little video um, about um, Tom, um, a client who um, requested initially sex therapy. Um, and he was put in touch with, with a colleague of mine, Sue Newsom. And ah, great, I've got the slideshow up. Thank you. I think if you just take control, I think you've got it now, actually. Yeah, I'll leave you. <laughs> Would you like to resume from slide four? Oh, I'm a bit nervous. If I do that, it might crash me again. OK, let's just go to the next slide. OK, so I'm, I'm going to jump straight to this slide here. Can you now see the new slide, the, the Sunday Times article? OK, I'm just going to leave that up for a second. I'm just uh, going to go back to the, the video and just describe what was happening in the video. So the video depicts Thomas um, having um, sessions with Sue Newsom, who is a qualified sex therapist. I'm not a qualified sex therapist. I am a sex coach and partner surrogate, which is slightly different. Um, so in, in partner surrogacy, the way that it works is uh, we work in a tri model. So the client will go to the sex therapist and the sex therapist may recommend um, partner surrogacy because sex therapy is just talking. There is no um, there is no touch work. There's no body work. So as you could imagine, talking is very limited. You know, it's very difficult to learn some learn a new skill, especially something physical, just by talking about it. It's kind of like, you know, trying to learn to play tennis, just talking about it. No, you actually have to get on the court with a coach and do it. So the partner surrogacy aspect of it is the doing. Um, so so I was called in to work with Sue Newsom and Tom, and we spent um, some time over a period of months um, exploring um, Tom's sexual sexual expression and what, what that looked like. So in the video, um, I'm not in the video, it's about Sue and Tom and she's um, running a session with him, showing him various different adapted sex toys that might help with his masturbation practice. And there's a little clip in there about, her care, about the carer um, and saying, you know, she noticed that Tom needed something in terms of his sexual expression, but was worried and posed the question, you know, how, how close can I get to this? Is this even legal uh, that I'm getting involved uh, somehow in my client's sexual expression needs? Um, so I'm sorry you can't see the video, but you'll be able to click on the link. Um, and yeah, part two coming up soon, I think, at some point. So this slide, uh, an update with Tom. Um, so Tom was the first person and the first and only person in the country to get uh, partner surrogacy on the NHS. Now, the article in itself um, is a little bit misleading. Um, the, the amount, the, 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 the money that they quoted that I received for my work is, is not true. <laughs> Um, and um, but the, the point was it wasn't about the amount of money. Um, it was more to do with the fact that Tom um, felt that this that this legitimized his need because it was officially recognized by the NHS, by the um, CDC, by his um, care in, in his care management plan. And so, you know, that took it out of the realm of something that was, you know, stigmatized and a bit seedy, perhaps, um, and moved it into the realm of something that was, you know, part of his his rehabilitation and his 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 basic care needs, um, which was incredible. And you know, well done, Tom, that he pushed that because you know he knows his rights and he does have a basic human right to explore and express his sexuality. Um, it's just that, 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 that there is provision lacking there on the other end for services that are safe um, and within the, you know, and legitimized in the eyes of the NHS, I suppose you could say. So yeah, Tom, Tom's case, for NHS recognition and funding um, 
it's very strong and uh, so we worked together and then when he went to put in for the money for the second year they refused and uh, they said they didn't say no you've had enough sessions they basically turned around and went back on their word and said it wasn't an appropriate use of public money um, which sounds very much to me like they realised that they'd <laughs> opened up Pandora's box and if they offered it to Tom, because clearly, you know, he presented a very good case, you know, and a, and a, a medical case of why he needed this, um, and that they offered it to him, there'd be others that they would have to offer it to, and obviously they weren't ready or prepared for that and the implications of that, not least that there isn't anyone apart from me to provide that service to Tom. So they closed it down very quickly. And um, we are, um, in, at the moment with Tom, we're in a bit of a hiatus and we are deciding what our next steps are. But amazing, absolutely amazing that he got this on the NHS. I think that is a huge step forward. And if they did it once, then they should do it again. Okay, next slide. So, what does the law say? I'm sure you're kind of thinking, really, the NHS paying for clients to have sex? How can that be? Um, but actually, you know, we've come a long way. 50 years ago, disabled people were deemed incapable of even having a married life or even having children. 50 years ago, disabled people were incarcerated into asylums and uh, segregated into single sex institutions and to even um, uh, you know there was the, the the practice of eugenics I mean you know the mind boggles and so yes we've come quite a long way and in terms of the law there isn't actually a law that says that disabled people are entitled to sex but it does, so Article 8 of the European Convention on Human Rights states that everyone has the right to, um, for respect for his or her private and family, family life and home. So there is no specific reference to sexuality, um, but a private life does mean, se you know, sex is part of your private life. Um, so, so sexual autonomy is guaranteed by the right to privacy because sex life is part of a private life. I love this little um, nobody puts disability in the corner t-shirt. You can get that online by the way, I think it's available on Etsy. I'll, I'll find the link and put that in if you want one. I love it. Um, so in terms of sexual autonomy and sexual sovereignty, because that's what we're talking about here, that everyone has the right to sexual autonomy and sovereignty and when we talk about um, e uh, diversity and inclusion and in equality we also have to think about the word equity which means that it's a level playing field that everyone gets what they need to be able to ex explore what they need to explore so um, sexual sovereignty for example are freedoms from things like sexual deprivation and stigma and discrimination and freedom from ableism and freedom from the ideal body shape and freedom from body shaming and freedom from slurs such as social burden or lame or you know some other unpleasant words that are used to describe disability um, and also freedom from overprotective safeguarding because people with disability have the same um, the same rights you know that there's the there's the thing about safeguarding versus risk you know and there's a a danger um, that we kind of over safeguard our clients perhaps and in terms of sexual autonomy that's freedom to do things so the freedom to explore your sexuality the freedom to hire sexual services the freedom to take sexual risks to um, get an STI, to get your heart broken, to um, you know, like just to get drunk and have a hookup that you regret 
that we all had those same rights. Um, the freedom to ac access adult venues and events, like the, 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 the freedom to go to a strip club, to go to a, a, a sex party, to go to um, a sex shop even, um, and also the freedom to sexual privacy um, as much as possible. And later on, we're going to be um, hearing from Scott, and I'm sure he's got a lot to say about privacy. Okay, so uh, I want to, before I move on, I just want to mention a little bit about uh, capacity, because whilst uh, people, with uh, people with disability um, it, you know, it's completely legal to access sexual services. Um, they must have capacity and capacity is not clear cut. It's quite a complex, nuanced subject. And I'm not a specialist in capacity, um, but I do work with clients where capacity is in question. And I work very closely with a neuropsychologist, say, if I'm working with someone with um, TBI or traumatic brain injury. Um, and the rule, the laws have just changed recently around capacity in that it used to be um, like the bar was very low in that you just had to be able to understand what sex um, is and what the possible outcomes of sex are. So, for example, you could make, get pregnant or get an STI, for example. Um, but now um, there's another aspect of capacity capacity and that you have to know um, or be able to understand that the other the other person that you're sexually interacting with has the right to consent so that brings it back around to consent all about consent okay next slide so I'd, I'd like to introduce Scotty um, Scotty's not able to be on the call today. Um, he had a prior arrangement, but he asked me to read something out on his behalf on account of his speech impairment. So um, Scotty was a client that I worked with. He has a traumatic brain injury and his capacity was in question, um, but we managed to find a, a safe way of working together. And if you just bear with me for a second, I can just pull up what he asked me to read to you. And also this very important thing about if it's about us, include us. And I've, uh, I feel it's very important that, you know, <laughs> I can I can share my experiences of my work with clients, but you know, it's important that they have a voice and that they get to say how it is from their perspective and what it is they want to see and what it is that they need. So this is what Scotty has to say. He says, hello, I hope it's been going well. Um, this is written by Scotty McLeod, who sadly had to go to my orthodontics for an appointment for them to check my Invisalign devices, which are moving my teeth to correct my bite and appalling placement of teeth. He says, I am a traumatic brain injury survivor in 2008. I was being violently ill over the train line at Clapham Junction after a drunken day with work colleagues when the incoming train hit me on the right side of my head, causing me severe head trauma. I was in a coma, but fortunately I came round on day six after the consultants had asked if I was religious as the, they didn't see me becoming conscious again. Uh, this episode, no, let's be honest, it was a total drunken failure to be responsible or even remotely caring of my son and, my mo and his mother. This almost terminal gamble with my life resulted in loss of conscious control of the right side of my body. And um, I'm not sure if I'm saying this word correctly, um, dysarthria, dysarthria, um, speech problems. I'm, I don't know if I said that right, you can correct me later, um, which is why B was going to talk for me. He then goes on to say, I used to, in the first few years, suffer from aphasia from the left hemisphere damage to my brain, but I, but I fortunately overcame that. Though it didn't go away, I just learnt lots of tricks to cope with what is left of the symptoms. 
Before the accident, I was an international worker in the IT trade, working for HSBC in Mexico and North America, and then held a senior position in the UK national consultancy firm. I used to spend my year teaching other staff about aspects of compu big computational systems, speaking at various international conferences for my specialism. Most people would miss that, but I don't have any memories of doing these things because like many, though not all, traumatic brain injury survivors have memory problems. He then goes on to say, I'm sorry if this was not what you signed up for today, but I think I have to set the context of what I lost for you to understand that I did not have a problem with what I lost, but I did have a problem with people assuming I could do everything I used to do and the pity from those who watched me not coping. This surfaced as real anger uh, resulting in divorce and I now see my son twice a year, which led to several years of attempted suicide because I saw zero value in myself and a complete failure to cope with my relationships with others. The learning point for me since I began becoming intimate with people again is the huge value of the self feeling of becoming intimate, even if it's just getting a, a massage. But the feeling of exploring someone else's body is exquisite in the immediate sense. But long term, the memories are worthwhile too, even though I remember very few details. But I have the sensation of pleasure and completeness, which bring me a joy even now. Also, please bear in mind, all disabled people have very different needs from intimacy with a coach. There are literally too many factors, but when you add the different aspects of human sexuality to the differences caused by our mental and physical disabilities, I stress all of you do what B does and tailor uh, the encounters to each client. And then he goes on to say, let me talk about the pros and cons of sex coaching and partner surrogacy. And this was a client, by the way, who had sex coaching, not partner surrogacy. Um, so the positives include the greater confidence from the social closeness and physical and mental release. I mentioned previously that clients seeking coaches will have very different ways of reaching the physical and mental release of endorphins, the pleasure hormone. A real positive is you may be the only person other than a carer or a parent to have any real interaction with you that value and honour you. Negatives can include the one classic mistake that many clients make, a refusal to be real about finances. I made this mistake and this was confounded by being a man with no real experience in the world and not being willing to admit I had got in way over my head and was drowning. But because I thought the world expected me as a man to tough it out, it would be okay. B did ask me at least once about my finances. I don't remember, but that's the value of journaling. Even if I don't remember the, the conversation, I do have my journal to fall back on. Please do what B did and ask your clients about their finances, not to be nosy, but to keep them from making the huge mistake I did and the panic of being forced to face reality. Another negative is those being coached can put off engaging with others and making friends because their coaches become their way of engaging with the world. Ask and encourage your clients to go out, even if they don't want to. I didn't go out for months. I didn't make new friends or find hobbies. Encourage your clients to do this. Um, and I know he's not here, but I just really want to thank Scotty for his bravery in speaking out and being public about his, his experiences, his journey um, with intimacy, with coaching and how he moves in the world now. Okay, moving on. So when we talk about disability and sex coaching and partner surrogacy, who, who, who um, is suitable for this kind of work, I suppose would be a good way of putting it. 
And I put up this slide here of the um, disability pride flag, and I'm not sure how many of you have come across this or are aware of disability pride, but it's um, disability pride month every July and has been since 1990. And it's shocking that in this day and age with the LGBTQ plus um, movement that disability still doesn't have very much um, exposure or recognition or promotion. So I thought I'd put this flag up because the, um, the, uh, the rainbow there represents different disabilities. So I work with people with physical disability, so the red, the red bit, um, and that's cognitive, um, uh, okay, there's an example of my brain just going, no, nah, not going to let you have that word. Congenital and um, acquired. So um, uh, congenital, so from birth, so um, uh, cerebral palsy, spinal bifida, and acquired disability, so somebody who's had uh, an accident or an illness later in life, um, so spinal cord injury, TBI, loss of limb. I also work with um, people with cognitive and intellectual disabilities. So um, TBI, again, is a good example of someone with cognitive impairment and learning. I work with people with learning difficulties. And this is a little bit of a gray area because, you know, often capacity um, is in question and there needs to be uh, extra safeguarding around that to make sure um, like we've heard from Scott, that they don't get into financial difficulty and that we are able to um, make sure that the, the attachments that they develop towards a coach or a surrogate is healthy and not problematic and doesn't stray into the realm of addictive behaviour patterns. And in my own practice, I avoid this by um, limiting the sessions to a maximum of, well, depending on the disability, and the level of complexity, maybe six to eight sessions, um, so that we do a kind of complete piece of work. And then after that, we um, then have an evaluation and decide how to move forward. And usually by that point, I've pretty much taken them through everything that I, um, that I can. And then it might just be ongoing that they want um, sexual release. And so therefore that moves more into the realm of um, sex workers and traditional sex work and less about coaching and health and well-being and personal growth and development and sex education. Um, I also work with um, so hidden and undiagnosed um, disabilities so I might be working with um, a patient with um, prostate cancer for example um, who um, has reduced sexual function or feeling and may need to use equipment like um, a penis pump and a, a ring to be able to maintain erection. Um, so in that case, it's like they don't want to go out into the world and explore that, you know, in their hookups or even with their partner. Some of them want to do that, you know, in a, in a, in a closed setting with a coach um, and to kind of process and reframe their sexuality. I also work with clients with micro penises, stomas, catheters, um, and also OCD. Um, blue represents mental illness. This is a, a, gray, a, a gray area where I'm not really, um, well, I'm developing my practice around this. I don't work with anyone who has an active psychiatric diagnosis because um, and they need to have quite a strong sense of self and be able to distinguish reality from fantasy to be able to work safely within the parameters um, so that consent um, can happen. Um, so yes, depending on the mental illness and, and also I would want to be working in conjunction with a therapist or a clinician if I was going to take on someone with quite a severe mental illness so there is a safeguarding issue there and then uh, the green stripe in the rainbow represents um, sensory perception so hearing and sight uh, impairments and I also work with non-verbal clients as well um, and just a little note about the pride flag there the, it's on a black background and the black is to remember all of the people who died of um, suicide negligence and eugenics Okay, 
So what are the long term relationship needs um, with um, the long term relationship with complex needs with with someone with a disability who's say married or, you know, who was what, how to make a relationship sustainable? Um, and I guess the best person to speak about this is Scott. I've invited Scott to come and talk to us. And I've got a couple of questions for Scott. Hi, yeah. Hi, yeah. Great. Hi, hi. Thank you very much for coming on the call. I've got it. Hang on, hang on. See if I can. Oh. I turn oh. mic down and everything ready for this. I've still got echo. Um, it's great. Yeah. I can I can hear you. That's better. Um, it's not so bad now. Go ahead. Um, so um, Katie and Scott, Katie's not on the call, but she's given her full consent for us to talk about this. Is that right, Scott? Yeah, absolutely. Um, I can't do anything without my wife's permission. <laughs> she's the boss. Great. So I've got a couple of questions here. Is that OK if I ask you some questions about, Go for it. Yeah. Go for it. about sex and intimacy and being in a long term relationship? Yep. Great. Yep. So please describe your current relationship status and a little bit about your um, previous relationship relationships. If any. Um, so I'll start with previous relationships because that was very limited. Um, yeah, so, I, you know, I've got cerebral palsy, so I went to an able-bodied school and got very limited experience of able-bodied partners. Uh, so... I sort of gave up on looking for ladies or uh, and met Katie, my wife now, um, at the Star College because I was just determined not to meet a lady at that point. And in typical fashion, she wheeled into my life. I was ready to move on from relationships. And uh, yeah, and I, I basically love at first sight, really. And uh, that's that's the early my my early relationship things were very limited but then I met Kate and we've been together 18 years now as of August 30th this year and um, we've been married eight years and it took me 10 years to convince her to marry me so it was, <laughs> it was a lot of work but she's worth it she's the love of my life um yeah and that's that's me really in terms of relationships and, and meeting Katie and, and thank like you that. what barriers have you had to overcome to be in a long-term relationship oh um, um having, having to, to accept, accept that everyone, everyone knows, knows what's in my book uh, mine and Katie's life book as I describe it um and and, and the way I cope with that is through humor and overcoming it barriers by literally uh, our attitude, myself and my wife's attitude, is if there's a wall climb over it, and if the wall's too um, tall to climb over, smash through it. And if you do enough research, you can do either. You've just got to not give up. And that's how I come across TLC. And that's how I come across B. Um, because I'm just a big time researcher and any any limitation in myself and my wife's way we we just overcome it um so yeah hopefully that answers that question i'm kind of cloudy myself today so i'm trying my best to keep track of the question you asked and okay. give you a, a a good answer let um, me know if you need to repeat it again no 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 i think i, okay. I think I okay. hopefully i got that one great Growing up, what did you internalise about sex and relationships um, being a person with C CP? Yeah, uh, I was, I was incredibly ashamed, um, uh, especially because I've got quite a particular fantasy. I've had it since I was like eight years old. Like most people of that age, they realise which, which direction they are intimate-wise. And... Um, yeah, it, it was obvious to me, but it wasn't obvious around uh, the other people around me. Um, so, yeah, it, I, it was it was shame, really, big time shame. And then, my, which is not not good, I I caught sort of got caught whilst I was sort of experimenting with that through um, the you know porn and things like that and I got caught by a family member watching that type of footage 
and the answer what the answer I got was thank God you're in uh, in a wheelchair because you'd be a rapist mm. um so that clouded a massive misinterpretation of what my fantasy was and what the, the actual purpose of the fantasy and and thank God I've got a disability because I'd absolutely be this absolute scumbag that just wants to go around hurting people and women and um so I grew up with that but I also grew up with the fact that my life's an open book so how do you hide something you're ashamed of when and and B help me see that it's nothing to be ashamed of that particular fantasy in fact it's quite common now so I feel like my wings have spread and I'm like yes I'm not not a criminal um normal <laughs> I'm normal yeah um yeah so so it it was really difficult to get that kind of in order to be an open book you have to be proud of who you are and I'm literally proud of who I am what I need to overcome um in order to like I said research things to death um and and when it's awkward I use humor to diffuse it for myself and the people involved but if you if you believe in your heart of hearts that what you a big part of you is is shameful how do you hide that mm. and that destroyed me yeah. that destroyed half of me in 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 the intimacy sense um my wife knows absolutely everything about me but until I was open enough to be and it was just recently wasn't it be honest enough to 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 she didn't know that part of me really yeah and that's somebody that knows everything else about me so yeah I didn't go on too much with that one, but my last question, Scott. Um, in terms of the the carers and the people around you and your team that support, yeah. what would make sustaining a long term intimate relationship easier for you? What do you? What is it you need from your team, from your carers? Okay. <laughs> this is a difficult one because I I, I internalize it all, so I don't. I, not that I don't care what the PAs think, but I, I've, I've, I have to be an open book. I sort of have to, I gauge the person. So I guess it'd be easier to believe that I don't have to be a comedian to each person and gauge whether or not the person on shift is comfortable with B turning up. Um, yeah, that type of thing. So gauging without talking to them about it because some people might even be uncomfortable with the conversation you, as a disabled person you get very good at gauging what you think somebody will be offended by mm -hmm. and that's really difficult but if I felt like I like there was more of a fair playing field of this is a medical like a medical need or in the case of the previous cases or in the case of myself and my wife it's opening a more elaborate sex life so that we can experience things together without resentment and ultimately splitting up because like I said she's the love of my life so yeah I think that's I think that's the answer I've got there with that one. Great thank you very much Scott for coming on the webinar and sharing some of your experiences with us. No problem. Thank you. So I'm aware that there's five minutes left of the webinar and I've just got one final slide and I know I'm eating into the Q&A and I'm very sorry, <laughs> um, but very briefly. Um, so what can you do um, as, as clinicians, as RAs, as carers, as case managers, care managers? Well, I think primarily to have, your, have a sexual expression policy in place. That's first and foremost. Having um, a framework where you ask the question, you, you know, it's part of your um, questionnaire, you know, that you talk about sexual needs. What are your sexual needs? How do you identify sexually? What do you need? And um, that has to be part of the, you know, that has to be part of the care management plan. Um, and there are um, this SWAD and Enhance the UK that can do that can help you with that. What what that involves, what a sexual expression policy should include, and they can do uh, training. And the second aspect of that is to be trained, get training, get training from someone like SWAD and Enhance the UK that are specialising in this field of raising awareness around sex and disability, and how to help your clients access and express and explore that safely and, and healthily. And from my perspective. 
um, I need my clients to be intimacy ready. So what does that mean? So that means um, uh, to make sure that uh, well, they're ready for sex, they're ready for intimacy, they're ready to, they're, so, you know, the, cut their nails, please. Um, you know, put some aftershave on them, like wh however they ask them, what do you want, how, how do you want to be, you know, to, f for this session with your coach? You know, they're all going to say, I want to have a shower. I want to have my hair washed. I might want to put on something nice. I want to wear aftershave. But definitely, please do the nail thing. It's really important. Secondly, I don't ever have to want to work on a single bed ever again. If I have to work on one of those medical beds, you know, that's like on being on a bouncy castle in a single time. No, I'm not doing that. I need point blank refuse. Do any of us able-bodied people sleep, sleep or uh, have intimacy in a single bed? Probably not since you're a teenager. So, you know, double beds, really, really important. Or double mattress on the floor is really important. Um, what else? Oh, so um, uh, obviously, you know, privacy is really important. Um, and that when I arrive, that I'm, that you act in a professional manner. Like, so the, the work that I'm doing with clients is no different to their OT coming to visit them. It's no different to the hairdresser coming or someone to give them a massage. So whatever your um, beliefs are around sex work, sexual services, coaching or surrogacy, you know, you're there as a professional. So you have to kind of leave that at the door and um, just welcome me as, as anybody else, as, as you would anyone else that's coming to, um, to give a service. Um, and is there anything else that I need from you? Um, I don't know. I think that's it. I'm just looking at my notes. I think I, I think that's it. Um, if you want more information about hiring sex worker, either through the TLC, um, there's the Sexual Respect Toolkit there. I've put the link there on the slide. That's a really good resource. There's no, like, I don't want to kind of repeat what's already out there for you to look at. But pretty much that's that's it in a nutshell. I'm done. Viva, thank you so much. That was so interesting. I think most people will agree with that. Things that a lot of us didn't know or had forgotten or hadn't asked. It was so interesting and perfect timing as well. I uh, I'm get into a little bit of the q and I'm, I'm sorry about that. <laughs> <laughs> um, it's question time. Who's got a question? Please ask. We have one here, Beaver. How do you maintain your own safety? So um, when I take on a new client, I have quite an extensive uh, assessment process. I always meet my clients online first, either um, just me and them, or if they need extra support, a carer will be there as well. Um, and I run through a list of questions. I talk about, you know, I'm asking what medication they're on, I'm asking about what they want from the session, what they're looking to explore. And if I feel that it's um, that they they just want sexual pleasure for entertainment, then I'll refer them to sex work. If I think that they can engage with my process, um, then I will take them on as a client. Um, and um, a huge part of my work is consent. So uh, my, my sessions are a minimum of two hours. And the first hour, there is no intimacy. There's no touch. It's all um, laying the framework for um, good communication, uh, finding out what their boundaries and limitations are, them knowing what mine are, um, how do we reach an agreement? How do we say yes? How do we say no? How do we ask for more? Um, and until that is in place, until I feel really confident that they've really got it, I don't move into any 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 physical touch. When it's time to move into physical touch, um, it's non-sexual initially, and we're learning conscious touch. And so we're building um, building on it. And you know that some clients that takes longer than others. Some get it straight away, and we can move quite quickly through that process. And um, but for me, um, that's how I retain control of the session. That I'm very strong in my boundaries and what I'm offering. Um, and I've n you know in the three years that I've been working full time with in in this, I've never had a single problem. I've never had anyone 
um, behave inappropriately or disrespectfully or object. I've never had anyone be, uh, you know, objectifying me or treating me um, negatively. Sounds good. Um, um, sorry, sorry. Uh, another question here. Um, do you know of any male sex workers and are the rules different? So I do know a lot of male sex workers. There are several listed on the TLC. In terms of rules, there are no rules. So this is the unregulated. This is a new, you know, sex coaching it is unregulated. Partner surrogacy, um, we do have to abide by code of ethics and that's uh, linked in with sex therapy. So we come under the banner of sex therapy and they have their own code of conduct and ethics that we have to abide by. And we take our direction from the sex therapists. But in terms of sex workers, male sex workers, um, they, everyone um, works differently. I, I, and they come from various different backgrounds. Some of the providers on TLC come from a sexological bodywork background. So they have done some training in psychosexual psychosexual aspects some of them have done we live consent training but not all so it is very much hit and miss and so I think the key point is really capturing what your client wants you know do they want um, adult entertainment and just pleasure or do they want a more directed focused inquiry around their sexuality and um, uh, you know opening that up um, in a in a very conscious conscious way and I guess, you know, you can you can help them in that process. Thank you. Thank I've you. got I've loads got of questions coming questions. in, Beaver. So um, I have, a, so somebody has said, I have a client who lacks capacity, but clearly has sexual needs. What can I do to help with this aspect of, of his activities of daily living? So I would, when, when they say lacks capacity, and um, capacity, you know, is it that, because it, it could be that some people lack capacity for certain things, but not others. So the question is, do they lack capacity to consent to sex? They might lack capacity in other areas, but you would need to get a neuropsychologist to do that piece with them. So in terms of, yeah, in terms of, you know, do they have capacity to understand what sex is, what the outcomes are, and that the other person can consent, and that they can, within one session, stick to boundaries. Um, I do find that TBI is the most challenging disability to work with um, and not always successful. Um, and yeah, but when I'm working, if you work closely with the neuropsychology, there is an element of safeguarding around it. OK, that sounds good. Um, um, Chris said, I work with young adults. Do you have a minimum age that you would consider for a client? If you do see young adults, how do you manage the family's beliefs and expectations around your work? Great question. So I personally work, um, if it's in person, 21 is my um, my age limit. And that's because I'm, you know, I'm old. I'm 50 this year. And for me, it doesn't feel comfortable working with someone really young because there's such a huge age difference. So 21 is my personal limit. But technically, you know, 16 is the age of consent, but that I choose not. Um, and in terms of, um, so, and if it's just online coaching sessions, so talking sessions, then I'll lower that to 18. And I, I do have a client who's 18 and he's autistic and we do quite a lot of um, work online together, just talking through things. Um, in terms of parents, whew, yeah, that's a toughie. So um, I often, um, Clients often want to have sessions, but they have nowhere to go because they live with um, their parents or they have carers and they don't want the, anyone to know. And so um, we um, hire a space, um, unfortunately, because I don't have a, a space at the moment. That's my vision to create a space. So we're often working um, in a hired room um, or an, uh, an Airbnb room or even a hotel, which is not ideal. I don't like working in hotel rooms. I can't control the environment. I don't have all the equipment that I often need and it's not okay. And um, that's a big part of my campaigning that this is actually properly recognized as a rehabilitation and therefore it needs proper clinical space to work in. So um, yeah, that's how we get around that. We kind of go sneaking around and sneak into hotel rooms, I'm afraid. Not ideal. Okay. Thank you. Thank you. 
Um, um, one more here. I don't know if anyone else has got anything, but let me just ask this last one here. Have you worked with any case managers to help their clients meet their sexual needs? Um, uh, not directly. Um, I often get contacted by case managers and they say, oh, I've got this client, that client. Can we set up a call? Um, that's happened several times and then um, they've either, back, either backed out or I've not heard back from them. There seems to be something that kind of is blocking, getting in the way, and I'm not sure what that is. Um, I have worked in a couple of uh, uh, sheltered, like assisted housing setups. My contact with uh, staffing there is minimum. I'm just signing a register and walking in. So not really. And that's that says a lot, actually. That kind of tells me that the sexual expression policies and training isn't really in place yet. Um, you know, the, the system is the, the There isn't a service delivery model um, really there yet, which we know of. I mean, you know, the fact that I've got a waiting list of 40 clients <laughs> shows that, you know, the, the need is there, but the, the setup isn't, the framework's not in place, the, there aren't enough people doing this and the conversations are just starting to happen. That's interesting. That's interesting. I think this is, a great, this is a great start for our industry here. You know, just we've got, we've had a good um, turnout and just listening to you, I'm sure people are going to be fascinated by what you can provide and how that can help our clients. And listening to Scott as well was just amazing. It was so good of him to be so open um, and share his his. Um, sorry, Scott, I know you're still there. I've just seen. No, I can hear you. I was just oh, saying, good. Thank, say you, Scott. I was thank, thank you so I much. Un, I just unmuted to say thank you. Um, no, it's B that. We have to thank because, you know, I, I wouldn't be here on this call and I wouldn't be the husband. Like, I consider myself a good husband for, for my wife anyway, but my wings have come out even more. My wife has now got an even more com comfort confident, comfortable husband. So it's B that we have to thank, not That's just me. Fantastic. Thank you, Scott. Thank you. No worries. Um, I've got Jessica's just asked, how have you dealt with the recent law change surrounding accessing sexual services when the client cannot access these independently? Great, great question. Yes, there has been a bit of a debate going on and there's some confusion around the law as it stands. We have um, Claire Detan, who is um, a disability human rights lawyer. She's part of SHADA, the Sexual Health and Disability Alliance. She gave a presentation at our last meeting to clear up this, um, you know, uh, drama. Um, and so basically that was a very complex case. It was a kind of one off case. And in that case, it was deemed that there was no capacity and that he wasn't allowed that. That doesn't apply across the board to everyone else. It's still completely legal for you to help a client access sexual services if they are above the legal age of consent and they have capacity to consent to sex. And the way that it was reported in the media was was, you know, alarming and it made it sound like it was illegal, but it actually isn't. We've had that from Claire Detan. She she knows her stuff. She's thoroughly investigated it. And that's the that's journalism for you, I'm afraid. Yeah, but yeah. it is still completely legal for you to help your client book a sex worker, book sexual services, book surrogacy, book th sex therapy. But the, just the one thing I forgot to mention about the sex co uh, the partner surrogacy is it is prohibitively expensive because the client has to pay for sex therapy and the partner surrogate. So you know, unless it's quite a complex case where sex therapist is kind of needed or a neuropsychologist is needed as part of the team to help this facilitation, then um, to, I, most of my clients come down the route of sex coaching, conscious sexuality, somatic sex coaching, because it's they don't have to pay a therapist, it's cheaper. Excellent. I think we've we got to just tie it up there because we've overrun, but I think there's probably going to be lots more questions. Um, I think it's been fascinating. I am so grateful to you for sharing your story and being so open, especially at the beginning, Beva, and telling us how you started all of this. And it's a it's a, a really um, great platform to know where you're coming from. So thank you for being so open. Thank you for all of your your information. We're getting loads of great 
comments coming through. I think this is something that will have to be done again. I think because working in this industry with so many case managers and clinicians and um, other other professions, I just, just think this is very untapped. I think there's just not enough knowledge and it, it's not okay enough to chat about. I do think that's shifting. It's really starting to shift. And yeah, a, lot, yeah. a lot of clinicians and, and top people are now sitting up and paying attention and recognising that they have to do something. It's not OK. <laughs> it's not OK as it stands at the moment. And it's happening and it's really exciting. And we're right at the forefront of something new and pioneering. Yeah. And it's great that you're all here because that shows that you're ready for this, this conversation and you're, um, you know, an ally. Yeah, yeah, definitely. definitely. Stephen, thank, thank you. you. We're getting lots of comments. Um, we will hopefully see you again very soon. Scott, thank you too. Um, and thank you everybody for coming. Um, and no, thank you for having me. Thank you for having me. It's a pleasure. And thanks everyone for coming. Please let us know your thoughts um, on this. Um, and if there's anything else you need from um, the mayor team. But um, have a great day, everybody. Thank you. Thank you. Thank, thank, you, thank you, Beaver. You're welcome. Thank you. Thank you. Thanks. Bye. Thank you. Bye. Hey.